Uh, hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV. I'm still getting used to using Wine World TV rather than the old version, Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, and I'm here at Slate Mill Collective. This is a really cool spot, and I've heard about it a, a little while ago. I've been wanting to come out here, and I'm with Chase and Emily. Um, they're with the Slate Mill Collective, and uh, this is um, 0 for 2 on being able to use the drone. It was, again, crappy out and rainy. Um, but hopefully tomorrow, probably not, or Friday, I'll be able to get a drone out to take some cool footage. But um, so, yeah, I'm out here, and this is a really cool concept. It's maybe not unique, but it's pretty unusual out here in Texas, mm -hmm. while it's more common in other parts of the world. So I'll let them introduce themselves and kind of talk about what they do here. Yeah. So whoever wants to start first. <laughs> so I'm Chase Jones, and I, uh, uh, I'm one of the owners here. Um, more director of operations is what it's kind of leading to now. But you'll catch me giving tours in the vineyard, uh, mini hats. So, uh, and this is Emily Grass, and you know. You I'm the vineyard manager here. We have about 140 acres of grapevines that yeah, we're taking care just of. Just a little now. bit. <laughs> and I also run our PR. So yeah. All and, right. Yeah. And so really, I'll just jump off into it and kind of explain, you know, how we got here. Yeah, um, go ahead. Which is kind of an impulsive story, really. So I have, there's seven kids, right? There's, I have four sisters and two brothers. And, you know, that's a, a whole lot of kids. And we are from Midland, Texas. And we are an oil background. And we, you know, that's up and down and up and down. And so my dad was actually leaving a, a, a board meeting in Houston and drove through Fredericksburg. And this is gonna be a shout out to Mike Blakely. I think every time I do any kind of anything interview wise, I'm always giving a shout out to Mike Blakely and Annie because they're the reasons we're here. I mean, to the core of it, because they were, my dad went to Burger Burger. I want to say it was Burger Burger. I always mess this up, but he was eating somewhere on Main Street and just that live music, Mike Blakely was playing and you know, we're pretty amped up people, you know, it's kind of hard to shut our brains off. And so he needed something you know, relaxing other than the Permian Basin, you know, we needed to move and change gears. And so Mike Blake was playing live music and my dad decided, you know, we're moving here. Like we're going to do something here. We got it. We got to make a change. So my four sisters and my mom, we actually came here for a wedding venue. That's the whole reason with no, none of us drank wine. None of us knew anything about wine. I'm talking three years ago, a yeah. little, a little more than three years ago. And, uh, so we started looking. My sisters wanted to do a wedding venue. And so we found La Bona V, which is down the road. And it had about 140, 160 acres of fields on there. And people convinced us to plant grapes, you know, which <laughs> we didn't know a thing about it. So my dad sent me on a manhunt, right, trying to find anybody consulting, whatever the case was, just for the vision of planting grapes and selling grapes, just being farmers, right? I got four stops, five stops, six stops in. And, you know, looking like, you know, 140 acres is ambitious in Gillespie County. You know, nobody believed me because I looked like I'm there trying to like sell them weed or something like <laughs> nobody believed me. So I got to the Hollemans, which was 1851 uh, originally. And, you know, we became silent partners and they kind of held our hand the first year and a half or so. And then, you know, we eventually had ideas of expanding into the collective idea we have now and uh, uh, eventually bought them out completely and just it's been a constant hard hat zone for two years, man. I mean, we just finished the tank room I was showing you a little bit ago, right, like yeah. a matter of two weeks before harvest. So it was stressful to say the least, but we're done building and we have a pretty, pretty cool model here. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to share it with people and I hope we can help build other people's brands and our brand itself, you know? Cool. Yeah. Very nice. Emily, how'd you get here? <laughs> uh, I went to school for viticulture which yeah. is the science of grapevines. And in 2018, I started working at 1851. Mm -hmm. And a guy who looked like he'd sell weed to people <laughs> came in. <laughs> wonder who that was. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. And it was my first day on the job, so I had no idea where the vineyard blocks were. But my bosses at the time told me to give him a tour. And I just filled his brain with a bunch of random vineyard facts. Dude, we were, and it was 
over my head. I was just trying to <laughs> catch whatever I could, man. Everything was just going straight over my head. All I could think about was I needed to catch your number for business reasons, okay? I needed to get your number so we can talk more Vine talk later. Yeah. And But it's pretty crazy, though. Her first day on the job, and, uh, you know, I kind of just, it's pretty perfect, really. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, since we're talking about vineyards, let's kind of talk about that. So um, I can say that when, when I came in here with dad, I said, I'm no expert in being able to determine the age of vineyards, but I looked at the first set of vineyards. I was like, they look kind of young because I remembered yesterday when I was leaving from Pedernales, I went into town to eat lunch and I drove by the Messina Hof tasting room and I went there years and years ago and they were brand new vi they were brand new vines and more show vines than though i think they're mission grapes mm -hmm. i don't know they'll make stuff out of it but it's not really production yeah and and they looked really like big canopy um and i, I guess i'm doing vsp too are you guys using vsp over yes. here? okay uh vertical shoot positioning and we'll talk about that a little bit more shoot can explain it way better than i can um but uh it looked like really full and i was like wow oh, i think they're like seven or eight years old i don't remember it's been a while since i've been there I drive in, I was like, oh, they might be like three, five-ish years old. And then we get to the, we get farther in. I was like, well, those are like maybe like a year or two old. Yeah. Like there was more obvious. And then you told me, how old are those first ones? They're the, six. So when you first like, drive yeah. in to your left, the, our, our Tanat vines are the oldest on property. And it's six years old and seven years old. Seven, yeah, I was off a, like a year but or two. we but, have yeah. a bajillion babies on here too. You're about, yeah. you, it, the youngest is two years old. So, you know, your three, your, you know, your third leaf, you'll get a fruit. And hopefully, you know, our petite Syrah, like this year, our three-year-old petite Syrah, our little one acre gave us a ton and a half, which I was so happy with, you know, because people, you know, it's like, do you take your third year for, yeah. do you not take it? And right, yeah. the chemistry was amazing on it. So we took it. And so, yeah, it's what you got about 35 acres here. Okay. So uh, we got interrupted because uh, a light went out and um, I don't know why it should not have gone out because those batteries should last forever it's because you're interviewing us man everything Must seems be, to go yeah. wrong right. i don't know <laughs> anyway um so yeah we're talking about like the petite straw you yeah. got some good fruit out of that yeah really good and um so it pumps me up because on our on our wedding venue where we have the uh the hundred plus acres our, the bulk of our vineyards all two and next year three-year-old babies 10 acres of that is petite Syrah, and i am i cannot wait for that fruit that little guy the Petite Syrah and the Fiano are growing like weeds. Mm -hmm. And so we, we stuck to those, you know, a lot of Italians. Montepulciano, of course. You know, the Fiano, we planted a Sangiovese. Uh, what are some of the other Italians? Is that? And then pretty much uh, Spanish. Do you have like a lot any of Spanish. Alianico or anything like that? Oh, uh -huh. we do. Alianico, Alianico yes. Carmenere. About an acre of Alianico. Uh, Carmenere. And then yeah. uh, what else is up there? We got some Merlot, some Cab Franc. So, so they have 35 different varieties. So this yeah. is, I didn't ask it you to name it all. For it's like while. asking you to name all the section of the pop grapes. <laughs> Dude, but get me But going. times two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and pretty much the Cap Franc's kind of hanging. It's a little slow, but man, those yeah. Italian varieties I see, and I'm glad that people convinced us to do Italians because they are doing, yeah, they absolutely really love it off. here. They do. Yeah. Um, I, I know that with, um, uh, in prior visits and reading about Texas wines that um, a lot of people feel that be, the way that hills are, they reminds them of Tuscany. So that's where a lot of times they were like, well, let's try Italian grapes out here um, instead of like the usual Cab Merlot, which we, you can do and you know, you can have success with it. And I know that we, that's what we started with in Texas because that's what people knew. They mm -hmm. didn't pronounce those names. They can't pronounce Viagner. <laughs> Viagner. Right? Yeah, yeah what, what, what is that? Sick, Mon Monty Pull what? Monty yeah. Pull Key, what? Yeah, <laughs> Aglian, uh, yeah, they, they, they can't pronounce these, these weird grape names. So they went with what everybody knew. And now we see that other grapes can do really well in here. And, and we kind of talked about it uh, pre the interview, you know, about Texas is a big state and it's as big as France. And, you know, you can't just be a mono varietal type of area. It's not like we're Burgundy and be Pinot and Chard. It, mm -hmm. You've got to have a bunch of different stuff in here. And, and we're if, still we, learning. if we hadn't gotten any help, you better believe that's what me and my family would have planted. Because yeah. we didn't know, you know, we, I knew Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, like you said, so let's just plant a bunch of that. That would have been a that would have been a sad mistake. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and I think there's Pinot Noir somewhere in the state, but um, I think it's in the High Plains. Yeah, but there isn't a lot of it, and I I don't know if I've ever really had any Texas I, Pinot Noir. Same, I haven't either. But and I'm not saying it's bad, but I would Can't be. Can't speak on it. It'd be interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting to, to taste it. So, um, but yeah, so 
35 or so, whatever different mm -hmm. varieties. Um, you got a lot of acreage here. Um, so kind of talk about um, what the kind of the overall thing going on here as being the collective. What What's the philosophy with that? So we, uh, everybody told us the overhead of a winery, you know, is absurd and it takes a long time to make some of that money back. So we, going into it, knowing that, you know, we did this for two main reasons, really. And the first one was, you know, cash flow. We wanted to be able to support what we're doing, you know, because we know this is a long term game. And so mm -hmm. that was, you know, the money is the base of a, a lot of things. You know, I mean, it is people like to act like it's not, but it is. And then on top of that, we saw a good opportunity to help build other Texas wine brands. And so we thought, you know, it, it could build our brand, the cross marketing of help building smaller brands, bigger brands, you know. That's the whole system uh, uh, back in the tank room. We have, uh, I think they're 800 gallon tanks, which is, you know, on the smaller end, or maybe even 500 gallon tanks. So we uh, put those tanks in just to keep for, you know, if you want, if you have, say, like someone brings in two tons, well, you don't want to take up a whole big 1500 gallon tank with a two ton press, you know? So we're built to help build medium to small size brands into larger brands and eventually move off and build their own tasting room somewhere, you know? and. That was the whole idea, just to help help build brands and also have cash flow while we build our brand. So, cool. and I mean, and it was a need. I mean, uh, like I said, we d came into this business not knowing anything about it, but everybody was telling us, "You guys should you should do the custom crush. I should do the custom crush." And so we're like, "Well, I guess I guess we're gonna do the custom crush, right?" And so <laughs> yeah. here we are. You know, finally construction's done, and we had our grand opening in February. But with everything going on, you know, perfect timing to have a grand opening because we got closed right down. And so we were jumping through right. all kind of loopholes to stay open, man. I don't know if you want to go into that or not. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's relevant what's going on. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, we're still we're still dealing with a pandemic. So yeah, kind of talk about how you had to adjust, especially you have a grand opening, and then you have. Yeah. To, I mean, I know restaurants went through this thing. You guys went through it. You know, so other wineries are able to um, kind of weather it a little bit because they were established for a while and they had wine clubs and all that yeah. but yeah. brand new yeah, yeah. kind of tell me about how you had to transition to that i mean it's all about momentum right and so mm -hmm. we had our grand opening just lots of people good energy you know next weekend lots of people you know like okay here we go this is going to be good you know keep this momentum and they closed us down and there was no way we were gonna we were gonna figure something out somehow some way safely to stay open so what we did first which is what a lot of wineries around here did. Um, we would sell you guys a bottle and sell you a corkscrew because if we don't open it, that's right. the loophole we're jumping through. And so we, we were jumping through that loophole, whole bodies, man. You just mm -hmm. open that somewhere we won't look, do your thing. That lasted all of maybe like two weeks. And then they said, can't do that. Can't drink on premises. Can't right. do that. So what we, what we got into was we would sell you a tour and give you wine. So you're not buying wine. You're buying a tour. Got and it. Just, you might, you, and I was answering the phones at the time, which I'm not anymore, I will say, because they do not want me for public reasons answering phones because they would call me and they would ask me, you know, are you guys, are you guys selling wine? You know, what, you know, are y'all, you know, he's doing wine tastings. And I would tell them, you know, who's calling? You know, who is this? <laughs> who, who am I talking to? And they're expecting to call, you know, a business and answer you know talk to a professional which you know I, i'm not gonna say i am or i'm not but you know you don't want to have me on the end of the line and it hoping you're going to be having some professional because i was just you know either way so i lost the talking on the phone job thank god and then so they told us after about three weeks of just you know solid tours which was also i had to give me some new balances can't do tours and boots man that was exhausting uh told us we couldn't do that. So now, which what I'm thinking is going to really work out good because they haven't they actually came out here and checked on us and, you know, you know, checked us off the list, you know, we're good to go. We have a food truck out here, Boudreaux's Cajun Food, and they're, you know, they we let them, you know, they're here for free, no rent, we don't take a cut, nothing. But since they're serving their food, we can we can pour our wine. And so they have a home with us for as long as they want because if we can pour our wine, you can stay. I mean, so that has been going on for Four weeks now, okay, four weeks, and so it's working great. So that's finally the last thing we've had to do, and it's working. So All right. we can stay open. So we have to make a little, uh, little like uh, camera change here. So um, we've got now the two camera setup. And uh, anyway, 
they've been really gracious to let me kind of experiment, which is what I'm doing here. Um, so uh, we've talked about the collective and all that. So do you, you want to talk about um, maybe who's kind of here as far as wineries? Yes. Yeah. So we, uh, the collective partners, I mean, we have, there's about nine or 10, maybe even 11 or 12. Um, but for, uh, you know, reasons I, you know, I can't talk about some of them, mm -hmm. you know, of course, but who I can talk about Ray Wilson and Randy Hester, uh, or, you know, Randy Hester's actually from California and he built a good brand there called lightning. And he, you know, as of a lot of people saw the opportunity in Texas to come and jump on and capitalize this industry in this market. So he moved down here and actually he's a, he's a perfect, perfect fit with the group. I mean, he's a guy, you know, got his, you know, a headband on, you know, looking kind of like a hippie, you know, which is like me and all my brothers and sisters, you know. So when I first came into this and, you know, I, from an outsider's perspective, the wine world and wineries, it's kind of intimidating, right? And you think it's going to be all suited up and like businessy, you know, this and that. And it was just a breath of fresh air to see a fellow, a guy like that, you know, it looks like he might be one of the brothers and sisters, you know, and he makes, he's kind of an experimental guy, you know, with his wines you know, bourbon barrel aged whites and that kind of thing. And uh, he has a amazing Tempranillo. Um, so he's one of them. And then Ray Wilson, you know, she has, you know, a couple different labels, you know, Wine for the People and, or the Growers Project that she partners up with uh, uh, Andrew Sides over at Lost Straw. And then she has her, you know, her Dandy Bubbles, which is rosé, still and bubbly, you know, which is a hit with people. And uh, those are the two we sell out of our tasting room. And also one more is... Uh, Josh Fritchie, which is our winemaker, his personal label called Tatum, which is his daughter's name, Tatum Rose or Tatum Rose. <laughs> Rose. Well, he, he he started off with the Tatum label, which was Rose, named after his daughter, Tatum Rose. Okay. And so, and it's kind of branched off now. If you ever talk to Josh for about 30 minutes, you're going to hear about Mouved yes. and, and then Mouved. <laughs> you know, he's a Mouved freak, man. So he, which, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, an amazing wine and he loves to work with it. And so his Mouved and his uh, Rosé, we sell here as well. And so those three. And, you know, you're going to get the passion of, you know, he makes our wines and he makes his wines. And you can just taste it in his, his wines. You know, I think yeah. he might show his wines a little more love. You know, I don't want to, you know, go too deep. But he, <laughs> he has an amazing label and a, an amazing wine. So yeah. those are the three we really push out of here. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, so we kind of talked about your challenges and we talked about what you have in Collective. Mm -hmm. Um you were showing me a nice little logo on a barrel. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. I'll, that that's my that's my cue to throw some uh, B roll in here. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we uh, so I, I like I said at the beginning of this interview, we moved here and did no thing about wine. Okay. So we have a winery that we're building. It was the previous known Torti Pietra was the winery right next door to Grape Creek, and they've been here for a very long time. Beautiful property great location so we capitalized on that in the middle of building this one we bought another one which is absurd i mean people thought we were crazy and i kind of think we're crazy too honestly i mean that's how that's why we're here and so we uh bought that place and we are rebranding it to be called slate theory and all that means is um in the psychology book next to the term blank slate theory the phrenology skull you know that they have has all these lines in it with the terms of which, you know, what part of the brain is what. And we just, you know, kept the, or kept half the lines, took the terms out and had this edgy looking skull and just put a crown on top of it just to throw a little edge in this Texas industry, you know, cause you're going to come and see me and my family and we all have tattoos. We're all just like a little edgy, you know, kind of taken back by people. You know, people are like, well, what's going on here? Am I safe around these guys kind of feel, you know? And so we thought we'd throw a little edge in there. And so, Slate theory is what we're going to be calling that one. And we are about, uh, you know, for, you know, they tell us six to eight months from opening, but you never know with, you know, construction. But mm -hmm. we're finally, what's taken so long is the caves. Uh, we've been building for two years now, caves in the hill country, you know, and there's not like, and that property has no hills on it. It's pretty flat. So we had to make our own. And so, uh, and how they did it was just a little, uh, they had a, like a big Volvo with a little rock, you know, like probably that big, just a, Boop, 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 boop. about a foot at a time man to dig that cave so we're looking at about two years at uh, maybe four or five months in now wow. finally about to dome it in and revamp the tasting room that's there now and then we're gonna open so i that one i'm 
I cannot wait for that one to open. Of course, 290, you know, 290 magic, you know, so I really cannot wait for that property to open up. Done yeah. with construction. <laughs> well, I tell you, 290 is, I mean, as far as like to have your winery to be seen, 290 is the place to be, especially, you know, between Fredericksburg and Johnson City that, that everybody's got, even if it's just a tasting room, they like, I mean, Messina Hoff, they have a tasting room there. Their wineries in Bryan, Texas, 4.0 cellars. Yep. Their wineries are all scattered amongst around Texas and they have a tasting room there because to, to get your wine in front of people, you, you've got to have some way to do it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and- especially in this market where, uh, it, it's hard enough as it is to get your wine onto a restaurant list or a retail shop. And then at that point, it's more of a hand sell, still mm. a hand sell. Yeah. So, and that's the unique, that's yeah. what Texas is unique. We can go straight to a restaurant, and open up an account versus having to go through a distributor, you know? So you can, yeah. Yeah. So that's the beauty of Texas, man. You, you, you're your own beast. You'd be as big as you put the energy into, you know? So we got ourselves people hitting those restaurants, man. <laughs> yeah. And, and speaking of that, but Texas also has a bunch of, and we're not the only state, but we have a bunch of just like backwards alcohol laws that don't make sense, yeah. but at least you can do that. Yes. Which um, which is always surprising to hear that because you're like, well, we can't do all these things. But with the pandemic, I mean, they did open up where the ability for restaurants, as long as you sell, sell food, to to uh, sell sealed bottles of alcohol. Though I know, I don't know if it was like elsewhere, but I know in San Antonio, some restaurants were like making the cocktail and they were putting it like a to-go cup. Yeah. And they're like, no. Margaritas no. to go, man. Margaritas to no. go, no, <laughs> you can't do that. But you can, you know, give them like the mini bottle and the setup. And I was yep. like, okay. Yep. But, we, yeah. we kind of play with that too here. Yeah. Doing the, the, those, these plastic cups with the seal on top. And if you tape it, it's sealed. It's sealed, yes. Yeah, so. I, I know it happens, yes. And I mean, you know what? At the end of the day, we're all trying to get through what's going on here and earn a living um, and trying to be creative. And the fact that the governor even went that far, especially, you know, the type of attitude that there is with alcohol, it feels like in the state, it's like this, like, Jekyll and Hyde thing, or I don't know how to put, put it, but um, I think it was a good thing that, that they did that. Um, because we definitely have, I mean, every state has these really weird laws, Yeah, yeah. but you know, having visited other states where they're a little more loose with, with the ability to sell alcohol, not, I don't mean like the tw- under 21, but just like being able to like how you retail your alcohol. It was nice to be able to do that. Oh yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, and I can tell you like, you know, again, not that I talk where I work, but being in the retail side of things and our sales are really, really high. The fact that restaurants can do it did not hurt us at all. Yeah. So, I mean, and I mean, it kind of showed us people drink when they're happy and people drink when they're sad, good economy, <laughs> bad economy. That's why we got out of oil for that yeah. reason alone. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we tasted a couple, uh, wines back there. You, mm-hmm. Can we talk about those? Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, we tasted some of our 17s. We have yeah. a, a Bordeaux blend, Bordeaux style wine. It's a uh, blend of our Cabernet, Cap Franc, Petite Syrah and heavy on the Sangio. And yeah, that's more for uh, your you know your wine guys. You know, I mean, I could tell I wanted him to try. It. You know, it's you're more it's bold, it's complex, it lingers. You can take a sip and it's still there five minutes later, kind of wine. You know, and then we also tried, which is what I'm the most pumped up about for sure, um, a Malbec, which is kind of our bridge the gap wine, uh, for to, for lack of better terms. I mean, I know uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but I know a lot of your taste comes from your smell. Is it seventy percent? A lot, yeah. It's so like, it's, a ton comes from your, from your sense of smell because really all we taste in our taste buds is bittersweet, bittersweet, salt, sour, and then umami is the fifth sense. Mm-hmm. And all the actual flavors are coming retronasally into your nose. So if you're tasting chocolate, you're really tasting just the sugar. Mm-hmm. The sweet, if it's a sweet chocolate or if it's a bitter chocolate, you're just tasting the bitterness and the sweetness. And then the actual aromas of the chocolate are going into your nose. So, and maybe there is some actual other taste on your tongue, but how I understand it, it's, it's really just like four, five actual black and sensations white. that your tongue actually transmits to your brain and everything else is through your nose. So that's why when you see people smell the wine first, you get that. But then when you taste it, when your mouth, when your mouth warms up everything and you have different esters and then my trick is when I'm tasting, especially when I'm evaluating wine, is I'll, I'll keep the wine in my mouth and I'll breathe out through my nose to accentuate that 
that um, retronasal thing, mm -hmm. and it'll help. It doesn't help all the time. But it'll help sometimes. When I'm really trying to struggle with a blind tasting. I'm like, like, what I'm trying to figure out what's what's in the wine, not necessarily what the wine is. Um, but to, yeah, to touch on that, mm -hmm. I uh, right when we moved here, uh, I was going to Rotary and I'd met somebody in there that he was he he poured wine at the Grape Creek Tasting Room on Main Street, and I didn't drink wine. Like I said, I'd never done a wine tasting in my entire life. Went there. And he poured me, you know, a couple. Like, he, I had probably three whites in front of me that he had poured to kind of do side-by-sides. And there's a bar full of people, you know, and it is, you know, never drinking wine. I probably have that much in there, you know. And you talk about putting it in your mouth and breathing out of your nose and being able to, you know, really feel the flavors and taste and smell. I did not do that. I was just like, shooting him down in one drink. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And he was like, more. and my eyes were just water. And it felt like, you know, if you don't drink wine, it feels it's aggressive you know wine's a lot you got to like build that palate for a lot of people and so my palate was a, I had a baby palate man i had not a developed palate he's like so you getting those flavors you getting this and i'm like no like i'm not getting that at all man i'm getting that 15 16 percent what's going on here you know but uh either way so back to the the bridge the gap wine like what i was saying on that malbec you know it it almost smells sweet but it's not. I mean, at least, you know, it might have some RS a little bit, but I mean, it's a dry wine. Uh, but people get tricked into thinking they're about to get, oh, this like, you know, it's a sweeter wine, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of gets the people that want sweet wine. It kind of gets the people that don't like sweet wines. It's kind of right there at the Bridge the Gap wine. So more of a, a crowd pleaser, like we were talking yeah, about. You know, people, it is, it is. I mean, it's going to, and to me, I think, uh, you know, that might, in some people's eyes, be like a disrespectful term. I love that term because it means people are going to want to drink it. You know, mm -hmm. people want to drink it. I'm doing my job right. Or my guys are doing their job right. So, you yeah. know, and it's uh, it's definitely a crowd favorite back there when we're doing barrel samples. No doubt. So, yeah, I mean, and I, I use, I was telling Chase, I use that term all the time with my reviews. Um, it's not a negative term in my eyes. It's it's a it's a way to describe the wine mm -hmm. so that if, if the person's watching the review or if they're listening, if they're doing just the audio only, which I do have audio only, but it's not really meant to be an audio only podcast, but um, that they understand that I wouldn't say that it's code, but it's, it's a way to describe a very fruit forward wine mm -hmm. that might appear sweet on the palate, but is technically dry. Yes. So when you have that residual sugar, you know, you, and, and as far as like non sparkling wines, I, I don't, I think around four grams per liter is about the upper limit. I don't really remember four, five, six, somewhere around there. It's, it, it, it's still technically dry, but, and I, there's a threshold of sugar. I don't remember what the threshold for sugar is, but it's like two or three grams. You start tasting it, but nevertheless, the, the ripeness of fruit is why things taste sweet. So when I'm in a restaurant in a retail situation, they go, I want a sweet wine. I always say, you mean like Moscato sweet? Yeah. That's, or do you just mean really fruity? Oh, I mean really fruity. Okay. Because okay. otherwise, I'm going to give you like. We can be friends. <laughs> I can be, well, that. <laughs> no, but funny. I'm going to give you like really sweet, especially if it was red wine, really sweet red wine. I'm going to give you Moscato or I'm yeah. going to give you like higher sugar, Riesling, that type of stuff, and not just something that just tastes good. Mm -hmm. And that's what the vast majority of people want. They just want something to taste good. Oh, yeah. And we, while we will say fruit forward, we other people say sweet and so we have to translate that mm -hmm. in, into what and i do that too when i'm reviewing wines i'm like it's not sweet but it's very fruit forward but it might taste sweet and so like so to talk about that malbec so we go so cue the b-roll so we go into the <laughs> barrels and we're like sneaking through the barrels and uh uh chance is Ch yeah, chase. Ch chase. I, I had Dude, it right the first don't time. Don't worry, man. So here's the thing: I know a chase and a chance. Yeah, uh, I do. People always get them mixed. <laughs> so the uh, I will go. I'll tell you off camera because it's not important on the camera. Um, so anyway, I was I was uh, uh, we're, I was following him through the barrels, and he gives me the barrel sample, and it's them all back, and we get back to where we can see everything, and I'm like comparing color and all that, and I'm, I'm tasting it, and um, you know, oh, I smell it first, and there's all this cool stuff on there. And I was like, it's like this, it's like this chocolate candy that's got like like a raspberry fruit filling mm -hmm. or blackberry fruit filling, right? So it's got that sweetness of fruit with that chocolate, but there's also an herbaceousness to it. There was uh, some earth to it, and I tasted it, and it just all that was enhanced. So it's a really delicious wine. And I said, you know, I like this wine today. Maybe tomorrow will be my favorite, but I still think it's a good wine. Yeah, oh, and yeah. you know. 
we talked about how the the first wine that has most more change of essay than anything else that's more towards my palate what i typically like but i also recognize those wines are delicious wines and i tell people all the time sometimes you want that big fruit bomb and other times you don't you know mm-hmm. and some people that's all they drink you know they drink the one thing that's all they drink or they eat the one thing they always eat you know but you know if you're expanding your palate or expanding your horizons you know try other stuff that's the only way you know if you like it yeah. well so uh Back to my undeveloped palate, still pretty much there. <laughs> I was at uh, Brian's on 290, uh, I think maybe like two years ago. And I've always heard people, you know, old wines, if you know, have like a get an old wine, you know, old wine, old wine, old wine, old wine. So I was like, I wanted to get, they had like a 1970 something for cab in there. And I have never, you know, had any kind of old wine before. I get it. And I'm expecting like this world life-changing wine right and little did i know now i still don't completely know but old wines is it more of a learning smell and taste versus a pleasing smell and taste so um because it was definitely so was it was it uh (laughs) was it from the united states it was from yes california california so i mean all wine does this but since new world sorry since old world wine tends to you can get like a you can get like a ripeness of fruit on the on in the at the beginning and then it usually finishes dry like uh-huh. earthy dry and new world wine tends to keep that ripeness of fruit throughout and this is generalizations this is not like a, you know a slam dunk by any means but all wine eventually just tastes old so you get that earthy dried out fruit from the beginning yeah. and you also will get so it'll be oxidized so you'll get um this was red wine or white wine? The red wine. Red wine. Yeah, you might get some nuttiness, but you know, with the oxidation, you're going to get um, really that dried out fruit. You'll get a lot of earthiness. You'll get, depending on the wine, maybe some mushrooms, some forest mm-hmm. floor, something you wouldn't necessarily gotten with that wine if it was, you know, Younger. if you drank it in like 76 or 77, it would have been more fruit forward. But if it was California, mid 70s, they were trying to make it closer to old world anyway. Uh-huh. It wasn't until you got the late 80s and early 90s that California really went for that high alcohol, you know, 15%, 14.5% wine that was really, really fruit forward. And and then Robert Parker was around that time and he that was his palate. So everybody was trying to make wines to Today. please Robert Parker's wine advocate. Yeah. So yeah. the Say 70s anything. wine. So that wine probably was maybe not exactly like that in the late 70s, early 80s, but it was probably not as what we're used to from California, especially those 90s. Yeah. You know, the wines were like the 90s and mm-hmm. the early 2000s that are super fruit forward. But yeah, that's what happens with old wine. I have yet to have another one. I have yeah. not had another old wine since. So if that tells you anything, yeah. I didn't enjoy it. Well, <laughs> but you know, I'm sure it, out there, but obviously. It is, it is something that is acquired. Like, exactly. You know, that. when you understand why the wine tastes that way, then you then it's easier to make the determination whether you like it or not. Exactly. And like the wines I drink now, I mean, I, because of Jennifer Beckman, I've learned more than I could ever, ever soak up. I mean, I just catch things that are going over my head, man. I just, oh, I can maybe hold on to that or hold on to that, you know. And so just from learning about wine, I feel like it's helped me develop my palate and appreciate it way more. Because now I see what goes into it and how from the vineyard to the cellar, how long it takes, all the love it takes or lack thereof love. I'm not going to mention any names, but (laughs) it's just, you know, it, it. it, I love wine now, man. I almost have a problem. I love it so much. Yeah. I love wine. You know, uh, a lot more. He talks about Jennifer, and I've known Jennifer for years, and even I would be like the same thing. Like, she yeah. is absolutely a wealth of knowledge, and I'm, I feel lucky to know her, and of course, of other people in the industry that, that I just all look up to. And she's such a, somebody I look up to. So, mm-hmm. um, and Shout she's kind of one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, she was my point of contact, and now Emily is. Um, plus, <laughs> Plus, my dad's namesake isn't around. I didn't see Vinny anywhere, so but I know he works here. We've known Vinny for a long time. Oh yeah, uh, through a couple different wineries. So, um, and my dad's over there. But <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Um, speaking of wines, I mean, I want to see what talk, you think let's, about let's this. Try some of these wines. So, which one do we have? This is a Viognier, right? This is a yeah, uh, 2019 Viognier, uh, six months in French oak. Okay. And uh, I mean, you, I catch a lot of pineapple on the nose. Pineapple with a little vanilla. And like I said, I love barreled wine, you know, cocktail or not, I love it. I love barreled wine. So that was one of the main reasons just to kind of, it's still got some good acid, but take that acid down a little bit. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, 
you know, I don't drink a whole lot of white wines. I, I love them, but this one I drink all the time. I so, love you know, this one. so it was really kind of funny like what you talk about the pineapple and all that. So I can see the pineapple. I actually really see the pineapple, but I get a lot of floral, which it, I'm supposed to get with Viognier, but there's this, um, it was like this kind of almost hoppy beer thing that was yeah. like an IPA type of thing, which I've associated with Tarantas first because of the florals in, in, in the basically Carbox Hoppadillo. If you want to know what Tarantas is supposed to smell like, drink Hoppadillo and it's it's like spot on. And, and it's like it's like the beer. It sounds like you're wine. making up a name, a play on words on Armadillo. Hoppadillo. It is Hoppadillo. It's, <laughs> okay. I, it's IPA at a it's Carbox okay. Brewery out of Houston, Texas. Okay. And yeah. it's an IPA called Hoppadillo. It's really delicious. They make oh, some yeah. really cool stuff over there. Oh, yeah. Um, See, I drink more than wine. Oh. Uh, I got anyway. Didn't you do a review the other day that was on beer? Yeah. Uh, what did I do? Um, uh, dang it. I don't remember. I had some kind of beer. I don't remember. I had, I had to look it up. But yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I've done beers before. I actually did a, a, a last year, I did a one, one show that paired wine with cheese, beer with cheese, and cider with cheese. And it was based on a book that had all these pairings and then I bought the cheeses I needed and I either had the wines at home or I bought the wines that were suggested with those cheeses. But yeah, um, yeah, beer, beer's great, man. I don't drink as much beer as I do wine, though I'm drinking more beer than wine recently um, because I'm just expanding that part of my, my palate because I have access to a lot of cool beers. Um, but Not yeah. a light in Keystone, right? I mean, that's about all I drink. Yeah, man. Dude, <laughs> you know, I, so, so the 40 subject, ounce bottles. We're on the subject of beer. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll admit, my favorite just everyday drinking beer is Miller Lite. Uh, I'm not booze, bougie about my beer. Uh, I think Miller Lite's fine. It's, that's it's Miller Lite's pretty cowboy. Yeah, yes, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's everywhere. If I'm in like a place that has like a cool set of beers, I won't drink Miller Lite. Like yesterday, I went to. Osberg, uh, Os- Os- that No, not Allstead, the, the restaurant. Uh, Oshlander. Yeah. Oshlander, right? So I went there for lunch. Great place. I seem to eat there all the time. I come to Fredericksburg. And I had the Iyengar Celebrator, Celebrator. And it's a double bock or a double bock. Um, so it's just a really rich, higher hopped and not hopped, higher malted beer, a little bit higher alcohol. Delicious. I had it with a spicy sausage thing. It has like jalapenos and spite and pepper jack cheese. Dude, I'm so oh, you're sausaged me out. So hungry. It's, it, was, it was great. <laughs> Dude, and, living in Fredericksburg, I get enough German food. And, and yeah, I could have had the Allstadt. And I've had Allstadt. And I kind of always drink Allstadt. Dude, but, they're lager. <clears throat> and and I, I only drink it here. I don't ever drink it anywhere else. But I hadn't had that Celebrator. Um, so I really wanted to try it. Yeah. Though when they brought it to me in the bottle, it didn't have, there's like a supposed to have this little like ceramic, like, I don't know if it's a bear or something like that. It didn't have it on there, but that's okay. But so, yes. Yeah, so, um, have you ever so had it? It's a very, very finely aged, very delicate white claw. Dude, I drank so many white claws. <laughs> I had my bachelor party this last weekend. Dude, I'll never drink another white claw again. I just had to say that. I still, I would normally be downing these, but I still think I'm hungover from the white claws, man. So, yeah. So, so <laughs> very, sorry. very delicate ones. So, you know, these, these uh, hard seltzers, I've, I've avoided talking about it for a while, but they are our, or not really our, but maybe more your and this generation's Zima, except that Zima was sweet and hard seltzers are not sweet. They promote this, you know, low carb and low mm-hmm. sugar and all that and low calorie where Zima was straight up man that's a sweet malt lick malt beverage not liquor malt beverage for loco for loco yeah <laughs> right? what? So, I'm all over the place <laughs> so I've never had a white claw but I've had a few of the other ones and there's one that's called ranch water that well yeah. there's, there's three I think two or three actual seltzers that say ranch water none of them are that none of them is the company's ranch water I can't remember the name of the company but one that I've seen and they have the regular ranch water and then they have like a like a, a grapefruit one, which is basically like a Paloma. Uh, and I'll explain what ranch water is in a second. And then they have like a, a spicy one that's kind of jalapeno, but it's not really that spicy. It's oh, more yeah, flavor. Yeah. So ranch water, if you don't know, and I didn't know until like about three, four weeks ago, and I did grow up here. And ranch water is you take tequila and you put club soda in it, or I'm sorry, Topo Chico and lime. And so the ranch water that is the... Um, with the grapefruit, so basically it's like a, like a margarita, right? Except you're not putting Mark's sweet and sour mix in there. So you have grapefruit, agave is what they what they're using as the base to 
to brew this um, instead of tequila because we can't sell those in retails in retail in Texas. Um, well, not the retail I work at. And um, so a Paloma is is basically uh, tequila, uh, and grapefruit soda, and then you put some lime in there. So I love Palomas. It's, I, I, they're really refreshing. But so this ranch water is kind of like a Paloma version of that. But anyway, so it's tequila, Topo Chico or mineral water and then lime. And you just make sure there's enough water and there's kind of dilute the, the, the tequila, tequila. So you can just kind of sip on it all day, right? Yeah, you won't find yourself behind a dumpster yeah. crying somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I imagine, West, I imagine in West Texas, you drink a lot of actual like ranch water. Dude, well, I, no, I actually <laughs> did, I drank man. Chilton's when I, when I went okay. to college in Lubbock. Yeah. So a Chilton is basically the same thing, but uh, they salt the rim. And it's vodka Chilton, instead of oh, yeah. tequila all day. Oh wow! I don't it get down on tequila. It is oh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. And then if you then if you put ginger beer in there, you're talking Moscow Mule with a salt. Yes. Drink. Oh, Have you ever had man. a grapefruit mule? No, I haven't. Oh my goodness! Damn, are we one of the They're bar so after this? Is that what hey, we're man. saying? See, I'm it's worldwide. Only... I'm worldwide. I drink everything as as I did last night. So, um, which that was you saw that episode already. You should have at least. I did not finish the Fernet, by the way. I tried. I had a little bit left over. I, I just, I, I, yeah. Anyway, let's mm-hmm. get back to wine. So this wine, yeah. Uh, let me taste it here. So, the fruit is really nice with this. Um, I get probably more of the pineapple on it. So I get a really good peach. I get some really good white flowers out of it. Um, it's got this viscosity, the oiliness, which you know, you're supposed to have. Um, that's one of the like markers when you're blind tasting, and it's you know Viognier is testable, not from Texas, mm. but it's a testable wine. So you have this kind of like um, coating of the mouth, with a little bit of oiliness to it. Um, I love Viognier a lot, and um, you know, yeah. I, there's lots of other Texas wineries that are, that put out some really good Viogniers, you know. It was one one of them was yesterday we went to um you know when we finished that interview um, we had some uh the reserve being yay they're from 17 they're like there's not much left i'm like okay i'll just go home with oh, give me. <laughs> I took home, <laughs> and i took home some of that true uh, yeah Reved from them too so um one of my favorite things i do on a production tour is compare our unoaked vna with oaked vna yeah. as a side by side just for mm. our consumers to kind of get mm. an idea of Learning. how oak Learn. can like impart secondary qualities on the Viognier. And now and I'm going to, now I'm going to put my, myself out here and whether I'm going to fail or pass, this is not oaked, right? This one this is, is out. So six months in brand new French. You kind of get like that roundness that He's it has on that the palate. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> no, no, not edit that out. Do not edit that out. But we'll out. have to give you some of our, our, our yeah. 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 So, cause you asked me about oak. I was like, wait a minute. He asked me if I had about oak Viognier. I'm like, ah, oh, bitch, this is the oak Viognier. But man, no. Yeah. Like, I don't get a, so the oak is extremely well integrated because this was new, right? Brand new, yes. So it's not an overpowering of vanilla and spices mm-hmm. and those lactones you get from it. Um, it was French, so American is more powerful with yes. that. But you still – it wasn't in there in the toastiness, but it sure. did what you said. I mean it's it's rounding it out. Yes. So And that's what oak will do to wine. But yeah um, – this is delicious. So it's same happens to me with um, Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc is sometimes the oak is not very uh, noticeable. And when we're doing our blind tasting, we're supposed to, if we're doing a United States Sauvignon Blanc or California Sauvignon Blanc, it's supposed to be oak. So sometimes the oak is really subtle. Yeah. And you can't tell. So you're like, oh, it's New Zealand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, at least you said it was me. Yeah, I mean, so Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> yeah. But oh, yeah. yeah. Um, this is delicious. Yeah, I just wanted you to try it, man. This is uh, we just bottled this about pretty four months ago, and I am yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm very proud of this wine. I love so it. So unlike I did a few weeks ago, where I was trying to game the system and be like, "What are my choices?" Even though he told me he had an oak and I was like, "I don't think it's oak. I don't think it's like I'll go no oak." No. Uh-huh. I should have just been like, yeah, "It's oak." I should have just gone with that. That's and okay. one of my favorite things about our 1851 labels um, is one of the brothers, Cody, is mm-hmm. our creative director. So every single label through the 1851 line is a picture of a piece of history here. So okay. he, on this, on this label, he went down to the creek and he took pictures of the wildflowers. That's cool. Mm-hmm. So that's, and it's you, not just some pretty picture you found well, online. And you hear, no, yeah. And you hear, you know, oh, the artist for the labels, he's a family member. Oh, they're probably terrible. You know, you just always, I feel yeah. like that's a pretty common thread, right? 
dude he is He's unbelievable yeah. and, and our slate theory yeah. labels are going to be more artist driven like these are two of course but pictures and you know kind of a little more mainstream mm-hmm. theory is going to be Ooh. off the wall just straight up like Stormy dark edges it is. oh yeah <laughs> Get, no, please I'm, rain on those vines i'm digging we this need. fact that it's, it's raining need. right yeah. Um, actually, it'll, it'll help because it won't be so bright outside, so we actually be able to see outside a little bit more. Here it comes. Here's some rain. And so. my favorite thing, if y'all ever feel like coming to our tasting room, Come on. we have a little pond outside, and when it oh, rains, yeah. you can watch the rain hit the water, and it's just so peaceful. And our little yeah. koi fish, we put them in there, the they're little tiny. Dude, those koi fish are getting big, and we got about 30 of them in there, so... And Come frogs. The we have a famous frog on social media. We did a <laughs> slow motion video of him. And it, he's leaping into the pond, and he does nice. this perfect tin dive. And we actually so. have a bounty out on somebody. Probably shouldn't say the name, but <laughs> there were two frogs, and one got ran over. Oh so, no! Yeah, and he's been here for like a year. So you know, you wouldn't think he'd be that sad, but we're all pretty we're bummed about close. it. So yeah. if you're watching this video and you ran over that frog, I'm coming for you. Somebody's coming for you. It's me. <laughs> nice man. Nice. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, yeah. I, I'm. I was. It's kind of cool. So, you know, I. I don't really get to see much. Um, oh, that's out there. I was like, that's a weird thunder sound. But, um, you know, when, when I get backgrounds a lot of times, you know, I don't think it's the first time I've ever had rain in the background. Yeah. Literally. Welcome to Texas. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going outside because my superpower will not overwhelm the rain out here. Uh, my superpower used to be it doesn't rain on me. Mm. So. Stay away from here then because we need the rain. <laughs> But no, this is this is a this is a really really um, it's a really nice wine. We have right, the so Cabernet here. Red. Let's check this one out. Yeah, hundred percent. Actually, no, ninety six percent Cab, four percent Merlot. Okay, um, shorted me. And it's just uh, of the, all the red bottled eighteen fifty one wines, this is most definitely the favorite. Whether or not it's actually their favorite, or it's just a Cabernet. You know, you never know. People just know Cab, right? But yeah, for sure. This one is my favorite, and when we we stack our pallets in the back about four or five high, and they saran wrap them, and I didn't want to climb to the top. You know, we have an in-house book, so I'm going to use it, right? The house book, I'm going to take the wine and not pay for it. Well, we have them stacked up, but I didn't want to climb up to the top, so I just started knifing into the side of the cases, and I probably got about a case and a half deep before Jennifer Beckman started raining fire on employees, no, yeah, man. She, she was like, like who's getting she in the inventory? What's going on? And I was like, Jim, sorry, it's me. I like, what are you gonna do? You can't fire me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just love this cab. So if I'm willing to drink this and take some heat from Jen, I think you guys are gonna like it. <laughs> what do you get on the on the nose? So initially, uh, I get like that kind of uh, raspberry confectionery type thing, like a raspberry candy, hard yes. candy. Um, there's a bit of cocoa to it. You get, um, you're getting yeah. some lactones. You get some, some of the, some of the wood here on this. Yeah, there's a little smokiness to me, like yeah. an under, underlying like, smoke. Too. Yeah. So like from maybe is it, is it, are they like, like a heavier toasted barrel or, or? No, honestly, I don't think it. I don't think it was. I yeah. just want to say it was uh, more neutral barrels than okay. anything with the blend of all the all the barrels. I think it was majority neutral barrels. Yeah, I, I think there's also like a little bit of roasted coffee to it. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think that chocolatiness is just now kind of taking shape in the bottle. Yeah, that was not. That here was before. not, and this is the first time I've had it in a while, yeah. so it's kind of cool. That's what I'm saying, yeah. man. It's like evolving in this bottle. One thing and, I'm very sensitive to is pyrazines. Yeah. And so uh, I remember smelling it. Probably it was maybe a month ago. Yeah. I have not had it for a month because it was so strong. Maybe a little longer. It was maybe a little longer. Yeah. yeah. But I I told Jen, gosh, it's just it's so heavy in pyrazines, and she's like, give it to me. So, because she, she loves, loves that yeah. characteristic. Yeah, so, we, we talked about that too. Yeah. So, pyrazine is basically, it can be, bell pepper is the most widely, but it can also present itself as like jalapeno and it can be other things too. But yep. yeah, it's kind of settled down a little bit. Yeah, a lot. So, a lot. Yeah. Cab, Merlot, the Bordeaux varieties, I think, except Petit Verdot, I think is the one that isn't related to all the others. Or maybe it's, Mal- maybe it's Malbec, it's not related to the others. I don't I think remember. we talked about Petit Verdot. Yeah. But um, one of them is not related to the others because, um, you know, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc got busy in the vineyard. They had a kid in Cabernet Sauvignon. And then there's each of the each of the parents got busy with somebody else and they had Merlot and Petit Verdot and Malbec maybe and Carmen, Carmen Air for sure was was part of all that. So they tend to have 
or they have precursors to have that pyrazinic um, uh, quality, which is that pepper, that like a bell pepper, jalapeno pepper, not black pepper, that's Syrah. That's a different, completely different aroma group and chemical group. But so that's one reason why I like Bordeaux's and I like Cabernet Sauvignon and Carbonaire and Cap Franc, all that kind of stuff because, and Sauvignon Blanc. So when you're having Sancerre, New Zealand and all that, you get that, that kind of, I call it Hawaiian pizza with some jalapenos on it, right? Mm, so you gosh, get the pineapple, you get the jalapenos, you get that, you know, all that, that, that type of stuff. So yeah, but it ripens out typically in the new world, especially like in a place like Texas or, or California. And so when the wine is finished, or at least released to the public, it usually don't get a lot of that, but sometimes it's there. Now getting busy, is that a textbook or, you know, or is that, is that textbook? I, I think it's good learning experience for people like, school. oh, I never realized that's what happens. That's, that's, that's Mark's way of describing. <laughs> there you go. Now you know. You consider because yourself I don't, educated. I don't, think, I don't think someone described it to me that way. They just said, we didn't realize that the name was in there all along that Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon was Blanc a, was there in Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. And they just said, yeah, they you know, cross pollinated or whatever. I was like, they got busy one day in the vineyard. I'm saying so. They were, ne they were next to each oh, other. We get it, right? Speaking people on your level. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm telling you people now that'll stick. So if someone yeah. like did know, now, you know, that that's my best wine story as far as like how grapes, you know, the parentage of grapes. Cause I don't really have anything far as great parentage. That's cooler than that one. Yeah. Actual. <laughs> Otherwise it's really, uh, it's really boring at, at that point. So anyway, um, no, this is, this is really nice. There's some earthiness to it. You get a little bit of that black tea. I mean, this has all the markers of classic Cabernet Sauvignon. So, like we kind of alluded to earlier, is like, you know, well, you, you know, you don't plant Cab and Merlot in Texas. You can. And this is an example of something that works. So, while Tempranillo and Sangiovese and Montepulciano and Viognier and um, uh, Vermentino and Fiano and all these other grapes are kind of like the, the darlings of Texas and they're, they should be. You can still make excellent Cab, you can still make excellent Merlot. Again, I'm not sure about the Pinot Noir part, but you can make excellent wines in different parts of Texas. You just have to have the right climate, terroir, and and all that kind of stuff. So, And yeah. when we were, you know, farming this estate Cabernet, which is, most of it is Cabernet, you know, this was my first time harvesting and taking care of the fruit. And that's what I was getting told. Like cab, you know, by people in the tasting room, everybody, cab doesn't work, cab doesn't work, cab doesn't work. Well, I harvested this Cabernet. Acid, the pH was three, six, seven, which is spot on. Beautiful. And my, yeah. and my, exactly my breaks were 26, five, 26, six. Okay. So, I mean, that was. So is this I like a 14 one... and a half then? Four, the it will, this, not this one specifically. Oh, okay. Like so if we harvest it this year. Yeah, this one right here. That's a 2017 from the Texas High 13.7. Yeah, 13.7. Yeah. So like, I don't know half is really well what the yeah. chemistry yeah. was on this one. Yeah. Because this uh, was neither. before we, you know, this wasn't, you know, a state under our control. Right, yeah. Like this was back when the old owners were here and it was in barrel and we blended it up and made magic. Yeah. But what I've had my hands on, I was like, damn, that seems pretty good to me. You know, like everything's, it's a pH problem, pH problem, pH problems that we have. Well, I don't know. Well, Which I think another thing, here, yeah. yeah, I think another thing is quantity. Look at Tanat. Everybody says Tanat does really well here. Well, Tanat is a heavy harvest. I mean, it can hold so much fruit on the vine. Mm -hmm. When you go out and look at Cab, the clusters are smaller, the berries are smaller, but it grows perfectly. Dude, it grows it's so just, good. The yield is so much lower. And so maybe people don't think that it's fit for Texas because it's not performing the way other varieties can. Yeah, and we want for us, we want I want I want quality much. because you mm -hmm. can make quality wines from quality fruit. Yeah. And so. to touch on the tonight, um, so like I said, this is my first time harvesting a vineyard. Um, I harvested my four-year-old tonight much too early. My bricks were like 27, but my pH was 329, Ooh. which was a lot of acid, so much acid. Wow. Yeah, so I had to let the rest of it hang longer than what I'd like to, to balance out the pH, to mix with like a 329 with like a 385, you know, to mix it, or to like a 39 is what I got it at, to kind of bring it to that good level. My bricks got to 32 on my tonight, man. So we're gonna have to 
do a little like we're gonna dilute it a little bit you know i'm kind of giving away you know whatever little, but first it is, it is yeah i mean we had to dilute yeah. a little bit but i mean it's crazy that's not we'll just keep going man 32 yeah. bricks like yeah it's like good lord so i mean this and this is part of the challenges in, in a climate like texas whereas california is pretty consistent year to year to year to year so while they may not have the issues with you know having that high bricks or that low ph which is high acid um you know, we also have issues with you know things that maybe don't maybe the acid drops because you need to keep the need to keep the fruit on the vine to get that phenolic ripeness, but the acid drops, and so it's not as bad necessarily with red wines, though you still need acid in red wines. It's more the problem with white wines. Now, Vignet traditionally, at least in, in Europe, is a low acid wine anyway, so it's okay. But even in the United States, even in in California, it, it it's whether they're retaining acid, they're acidifying, we're not going to get into all that necessarily. But acid is what keeps it bright and fresh. So, you know, there's challenges here. And so there's things you have to do in the vineyard to yeah. mitigate that. So you try to do the least amount in the winery and just let, let the thing go. Like I kind of talked about, like, with, with this, you know, I set levels here. I'll look occasionally make sure we're good. And then with the exposure and everything with the cameras, I do as best as I can here so that I don't have to fix it in the mix. Right. Same thing in winery. You do the, do the best you can in the vineyards, and you know a lot of times everything comes out great, and you just put in the, you ferment it, it goes a barrel, and it, life is one grand. Other times you have stuck fermentations, you've got yep. things are too hot, too cold, the bricks didn't come in the way you need it, or it rained on harvest day, right. and yeah. now the, all the grapes are swollen yeah. up, and they gotta yeah. either wait or have- Call the pick. Have, yeah, or you have, you're going to have disease pressure and all that, which we kind of talked about that that's a, that's a, um, a uh, an issue out here. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. And, and so talking about uh, like perfection, you ever go out there and like taste fruit and like, you know, kind of see the different levels of like what you're looking for. My first experience, like I said, again, first year doing this in the vineyard and my snot was starting to turn. It was getting raisiny, probably about 20 percent raisining uh, or a little more. And I've never tasted. I figured, you know, raisiny grape. It's going to be sweet. You know, I was like, yeah, like I'm going to go out there and taste these. It's, I'm pumped about it. She's with me. Make sure if you're eating a raisiny grape, <laughs> you make damn sure there aren't any holes in it. That's because the, that grape the was raisiny because there's a big old bug inside of it. Oh, wow. Dude, I ate that grape. I was like, and I, I was chewing it. Extra I was like, crunchy. And I was like, man, I was like, I was like, this doesn't taste this tastes terrible. I was, I was like, like what is going the, on? Did you check the berry before you put it in your mouth? Turns out there was a big old bug in there. Oh, so I got a little, I don't eat raisin grapes anymore. I <laughs> just had nice, big, solid ones. But either way, I mean, that was a not that specific moment, but it was cool to go through the vineyard and taste the different stages and the pH and the bricks. And it's just, it's a steep learning curve for me, you know, and we got to learn quick because 140 acres harvesting is coming soon. And, you know, I'm, I'm learning lessons the easy way and the hard way. Well, so. yeah, you know, and, and I've, I've really only have tasted grapes either like at harvest or, or pretty much at harvest. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've either had it like in the vineyard at harvest or I've had it after it's come back and they've already started kind of the, the, the process. I got to do that in, uh, Oregon last year when I showed up like right at the end of harvest for them. It was, I timed it, timed it almost perfectly. Like mm. I, I was able to go out like two weeks later, it would have been much easier for his appointments and everything. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting to taste these grapes. And then uh, when I went to Bordeaux, I went to Sauterne, it was harvest time, which again was amazing. I even got all the appointments I got and I was able to taste actual um, uh, botrytis, you know, botrytis infested grapes at harvest. Yeah. Wow. And it was fuzzy, but it was still like, I don't care if there's fungus on there because Learning. it's going gonna, it's gonna to taste really, it was, it was, it wasn't like it was the best grape in the world to taste, but it was interesting. It was really cool to taste that. Yeah. And I talked about it earlier off camera about this, this show has allowed me over the last 11 years to get like access that even people in the SOM industry don't necessarily get to do. Um, I get that extra bit of access and that's why I keep continue to do the show because it's fun and I like doing reviews and I like doing all that, but then I get to do these things and I get to hang out with people for two or three hours or more. And you know, I don't know where we're at now, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're pretty long into this, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. 
Um, so earlier we're talking about texts uh, off camera, but we're talking about Texas and blind, blind taste on a Texas cab and all that. And there's like a Texasness to wine. So I get this in the wine. There's like this kind of rusticity, bramble, like um, you're out in the brush type of thing, yeah. right? And I get that in Texas, mostly, well, Texas res, mostly like Cab Merlot, that type of stuff, or even Tempranillo. And I get that also with Spanish wines. And I don't know if it's just in my head I make this connection with because we have such a big Spanish heritage and culture in Texas. You know, it was part of Spain and Mexico and all that. Um, but there, I will get that a lot with Spanish wine, mainly really like Rioja, not really Ribera, because Ribera is really that more really fruit forward style, whereas, mm. whereas Rioja has that rustic and, and earthy style. But I get that out of this wine. And I talked about how... Uh, one of my friends who was in our tasting group brought a wine from Ben Calais, who hopefully I'll have on at some point. And uh, she brought one of his wines and it had just that touch. It wasn't a whole bunch. It was just that touch. And I was like, you brought Texas Cabernet Sauvignon, didn't you? She goes, yeah. Everybody else in the group just said it was Cab, but they were thought it was somewhere else. I, and I, I didn't call, I didn't call a winery, but I was like, she goes, this Calais. I was like, oh, I knew I should have called Calais. Cause it's always, it's like the, the golden ticket when you call a producer. We never call producer. You're not supposed to call producer. But when you call producer, you can, yeah. and you're right. Dude, I did That's blind tasting. So it's, it makes you feel good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, I got a ways to go. I did blind tasting on live on our Facebook with our wines. It and it could have been girls. It could have been old vintage like that we don't sell anymore or ones that we do. <laughs> I got one right out of six. So I got a ways to go of learning tastes, man. My own wines, you know? Like, it's just, I don't know. I, I'll admit it. <laughs> well, Emily Pissy alluded to it. Women actually are better tasters. They have more, they have they have more of everything that's necessary to taste, uh, whether it's wine or whether else. They are naturally so they better tasters. Ass. So it's an already unfair contest. If yeah. you're if it's men and women, it's unfair. We're gonna. I will say, uh, Jim set it up, and it she bad. didn't tell us that before. So. Yeah, dude, no, it's, it's absolutely true. Maybe women she are better, it naturally better tasters. It doesn't mean men can't like really taste really well, and that women will always win the tasting contest. But yeah, we, we have a little bit more effort to go through yeah. to to get to the same level that women naturally have. Doesn't mean that you know a man can't like have be a better taster. They can. That was the time when we did that class. The cab was going through that heavy pyrazine phase. Yeah. And he drinks a bottle. Well, at that time, we're, he was drinking a bottle like every evening. And oopsie. And so <laughs> we were all smelling through it. And I called it immediately. I was like, this is our cab. This is our cab. And we were comparing a cab from somewhere else. I was like, Albrainio? I don't know. <laughs> but it was like our cab side by side with another one. And yeah. it was just instant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's, it's never forget uh, about So, moral of the story women taste more. They taste better. They, yeah. They, they, they already have a leg up on us, which is fine because why not? Right. Um, so yeah, it's they they tend to have a better uh, head start when it comes to like tasting stuff. That's cool. And I think yeah. if it's just because they have more receptors in their nose type of thing, but there it's it's absolutely scientifically proven. That's cool. So yeah, I'm not I'm not Fun fact. blowing smoke up anyone's orifice. It, this is a legit thing. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can remember like so. Dad's asleep. Anyway, um, <laughs> I can What's remember over there. You know, early on. Uh, <laughs> I would do my reviews and they would they would hear it and I would be done with the review and I would bring the glass of wine and I'd bring it to my mother and I would bring it to my dad and mom always tasted things better and she was not a wine connoisseur at all. Yeah. She would taste she would taste stuff I wouldn't taste. I would like taste this. Oh I get this as oh what? Mm -hmm. I just did the review, I didn't even taste that. So and she wasn't even like, you know, trained or anything. She just would naturally taste She's better. good at it, yeah. And he's just like, it's good or not. Yeah, I have to like coach him to get into, do you taste this, taste this, and he's much better now with it. But you know, before it was just like it just tastes like wine. So yeah. I, I have I a funny thing to add to that. We, uh, we went to Lake <laughs> Charles. We went gambling. Three years of wine is wine. It's still <laughs> wine is wine, but he it, no, needs still, better with it. Because about what was it two months ago when we went to Lake Charles? We went gambling, and we went to the restaurant I've in the casino. <laughs> well, we went to the restaurant in the casino, yeah. and the sommelier got to talking with Chase. And so 
you know, Chase was nice to him. So he brings us wine and he's like, I'm going to bring this to you. What do you think? Dude, and he's like, awesome. we're, we're just going to release this in a restaurant. We haven't released it off the menu yet, but I want to get your opinion. And him and his dad and his, they're all, it's good. That's all they said. Dude, it was <laughs> like a 1992 <laughs> Alianico or opinion. something. And it was, dude, it was. It's like Master Brandon. It was like fantastic. That. It yeah. was good. <laughs> yes. That's all I got though. Damn, yeah. it's good. It's Tastes good. good. Yeah. He what do you, so he's all like looking for a reaction. I'm like, mm, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's good. I like it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm I mean, learning. I, I, I'm always learning. You know, obviously, you know, I, I'm like, oh, it has no oak. Yeah, it does. All right, that's fine. Because this is how you learn. You, See? you make mistakes and you learn from it. You find, find out why you make the mistake. And that's part of the appeal of at least what I would hope so. Uh, if coming and hanging out and drinking here with like me and my family because very unintimidating environment. You know, we're gonna be level with you. We're not gonna be some instant expert like a lot of people claim to be. I mean, it is what it is. You know, people are instant experts in this industry immediately. Yeah. Not us, man. I mean, we've been doing it for a little bit, but I'm willing to tell you that I don't know. But, but I can get yeah. somebody that does know that is part of our employees and they can explain to you probably way more than you'll ever care to know. But even they're still learning. I mean, even yeah. you're still learning and you said yeah. you've been doing this since 05. Yeah. So it's like you never stop learning in our industry and you can't be a know-it-all. No. If you're a know-it-all, there's no point. For and there's been things there. even this year that I thought I knew and then I researched and I was like, wow, I had that completely wrong. I had it completely backwards on certain things. So it, it, sometimes we thought we knew it and then somehow the wires got crossed and we maybe learned it wrong or we read something and we misinterpreted and then you think you know it and then one day you, somebody who definitely knows what they're talking about or you read it in the book or you read it somewhere or whatever and now you're like, oh, wow, I was wrong about that. You know, so oh, yeah. I, you know, as much as, as much as the confidence that I have in a lot of things about, about this industry and about what we do, there's no shame in like admitting you're wrong about something and, or that you just didn't know. I think mm -hmm. that's where you grow too, is yeah. like being able to humble yourself and say, okay, I don't know everything. What can I learn? Or yeah. accepting changing your mind. Or accepting. Being able yeah. to accept the fact that changing your mind isn't a weakness. Yeah. Right? Because if you have this point of thought that you have had for a long time, you know, you got to be willing to, you know, things change and, you know, yeah. your, your your opinion can change. But if you want to just be gung-ho to that, whatever it is, whatever, whatever you know, yeah, whatever, it is. whatever it is, you know, uh, you know, you got to be willing to, you know, change your mind yeah. and not view Open it as it a, a weakness, bit, yeah. man. And that is like yeah. my well, family in a nutshell. And that's my favorite thing about our, our production tours is it's an opportunity to let people in to open their mind to new things. Yeah. So we have tours all the time and I'll pour a wine sometimes. Well, I only drink red wine. Well, have you ever had an oaked white? No. Well, Let's let me out. change your mind. Yeah. yeah. And let me tell you why you should do this or Come what this learn. does to the wine. Yeah. So that's one of my things on, on what I do um, when I mentioned the word Merlot. I don't like Merlot. Yeah. You like oh, Bordeaux? Yeah. yeah, we like Merlot. What? <laughs> because most of the Bordeaux you're probably drinking is like 90 or 80% Merlot anyway. And it's like 10 or 20% Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, really? Yeah. Some of the best wines in the world are Merlot based or 100% Merlot. Maybe 100%, but Merlot yeah, yeah. based. So, yeah, I mean, we, we all think we know certain things. And then one day we realize, oh, wow. We didn't know. Yeah. You know, and, and that's a very fine tipping point with people like they won't accept that, you know, yeah. and that's what I see in a lot of, people. you know, I being in the side of things that I have done. So it's with the quartermaster sommeliers and being around a lot of master sommeliers who are just like we're talking right now and they're not pretentious. They, you know, they're definitely, you know, there to teach you some things, but having being having myself being humbled in front of them, not in a negative way, not because, oh, they're a master sommelier, but because I'm learning and they ask me a question and I don't know the answer. And either they're either they're going to point me in the direction to find the answer or they're like, well, this is the answer, right? And being around master psalms and advanced sommeliers and people at my level and even when I was, you know, hadn't even passed an exam yet, you know, just the people, community that I've been in, in that side of things, has been very supportive and you know our goal is to you know teach everybody what's going on and share the knowledge and not to be snooty yeah sometimes psalms can be snooty it. and sometimes we have our like our opinions about things and 
you know, we'll, we'll kind of like, oh, I can't believe you like that wine. But at the end of the day, it's wine. So who cares? Yeah. <laughs> and like, I don't care if you, if you crush white Zinfandel or you're drinking <laughs> Chateau Lafitte from night or sorry, Cheval Blanc from 47 was have iconic Bordeaux vintage, right? I don't care if that's your thing is you're drinking wine. That's all I care about. Yep. Yeah. Too, if you want to move out of white Zinfandel, I'll be more than happy to move you into Moscato or something else to kind of guide you to something that's otherwise, but you know what? Do you. Do you. Miller Lite all the way, dude. Miller Lite, yeah. <laughs> white Claws, you know, white Claws, shame. who cares, you don't have to have a whole lot of shame, but there should be a real shame with it's the White Claws. It's refreshing. It's a pool. <laughs> it's a great thing to drink at the pool. It's easy to drink. It's, it tastes good. It's refreshing. Oh, yeah. Sure, why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right on, man. Awesome. Well, I, I think we're kind of at a natural end, unless there's something we didn't talk about that you want to talk about. Man, I no. I mean, we. I think we covered the basics. I just... Yeah, family and wine. I mean, that's what we that's what we stand for here. Yeah, so. I mean, education. An education, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You have Jennifer Beckman in the mix. You know that comes with it. Right, Jen is awesome. I, I love her. Um, and and so, I don't know if they knew exactly what they're getting into, but this is how interviews go. It's, oh, yeah. it's basically just a conversation, and it's they get to kind of hang out. Like my dad's, he just gets to hang out and listen to the conversation. It's like listening to your parents talk about, to their old friends, talk about their old times, right? Just looking at you. Like, all the old stories. That's basically what we get to do. That's my favorite thing to He's do. He's like, you better so. quit talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, his hand was on, uh, his hand was on the Life with Mark episode. Um, so, so uh, funny thing. <laughs> it came on Facebook. You even talked about it. There was a blooper. I might put in that. I might have been in that blooper reel. I'll tell them about it later. But yeah, there was a little blooper last night. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, well, so yeah. you know about it. So yeah, that was a funny thing. Anyway, so I think we're gonna wrap things up. So thank you so much for spending a lot of time with me, giving me a little tour of everything. Too bad the weather wasn't so good. We could have been out in the vineyards and taking cool footage of, of it, so I could show all of you. And then it could have been a possible introduction to the to my to the what we see. So tomorrow or Friday, hopefully I get that. If not, I'm going to have to make another trip out to the Hill Country yeah, and get back. that intro shot for the vineyards. Come on. So I actually have the four vineyards, the four wineries I went to, I actually have everything planned for those shots. So I have multiple flight paths. I shared it with you. I shared it with everybody. So it's all ready to go. I just have to have good weather. <laughs> and hopefully by the time you see this, somebody somewhere had the good weather for me to come do it. So yeah, that's going to do it for this episode. Um, I hope you like the kind of multi-camera thing going on. Sorry that the other camera crapped out on me. I should have realized I was going to do that. But uh, experiment and process. And uh, yeah, look for some more stuff. I got two more Texas wineries to go visit. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time. Everyone, though. Let's try again. Whoop, reverse. <laughs> hope you liked everything. <laughs> I never do this anymore. I, I never did this. I always just like let, let go. And if there's a mistake, yes, mistake. So hopefully you like the multi-camera setup. Sorry that the third camera kind of crapped out. But um, yeah, we'll see everyone again next time. Cheers. Mm -hmm. uh, love that, but cheers. <laughs> Drink it all. <laughs> all right. Nice.